I've seen your personal life story of your journey of going back to your roots and even was surprised with having a, an identical twin brother. How did it actually feel the first time you met them? How was the kind of experience? I think by being able to meet them, it definitely gave me something that now that I have it, I would notice the absence. And then as far as creatively though, I, I wrote my first uh, solo album uh, after I met them. Everything just kept on pouring out of me. Dear Dan Matthews, I'm writing to share the information of your birth family. They have one son and they have a daughter. You may also find that your brother Ji Seung is actually your twin brother. What? Welcome to Meaningful. Marketing, mentoring, mattering. With me, Joseph Alcantara. Together, we'll uncover the power of purpose. Experience mentorship magic. Unpack ways to make a difference. And find transformative journeys as a community. Welcome to Meaningful. Marketing, Mentoring, Mattering, with me, Joseph Alcantara. This month, we're celebrating the rich cultural heritage and significant contributions of the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. Join us as we dive into the stories of innovation, resilience, and influence in the world of marketing and beyond, and how the community's involvement make a meaningful impact. But before we dive in, Please don't forget to hit the subscribe button and notification bell so you're updated every time we have a new episode. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Dan Matthews. Currently, he is the head of partnerships and creative producer at Transparent Arts based in Los Angeles in California. And he's also known for his work building one of the first ever Asian American digital platforms international secret agents with pioneers Wong Fu Productions and Far East Movement, producing over 400 pieces of content that have amassed hundreds of millions of views online. He's also produced projects for brands like Hennessy, Toyota, McDonald's, AT&T, and many other brands. They were also responsible for some of the first large-scale concert festivals throughout the 2010s, featuring Asian American and international talents. Dan has also been a very vocal member in the Korean adoptee community, producing several documentaries such as AKA Dan in 2014 and AKA Seoul in 2016, which have included his own personal journey reuniting with his biological family, including an identical twin brother. His work has been featured on NBC, MSNBC, BBC, and highlighted by the White House, and was even featured on CNN. And Dan is also an indie rap artist known as Dan, AKA Dan. He's been writing and performing for the last 15 years and has built up an international following with three full length albums. Please welcome to the pod, Dan Matthews. Hi, Dan. Hi. I guess end of pod. That's all you need to say about me. That's my entire <laughs> story. Thank you for saying all of that. Good to be on. Wow. Thank you so much for giving us this amazing opportunity. I'm sure that a lot of people will be very interested to hear your full story. What's your meaningful life story? So I will give you a relatively tiny version of that because I think that there's so many things that I would want to talk about. And so just to kind of just highlight some of the little juicy bits, I grew up in Southern California. I am a Korean adoptee. I was uh, brought to America and when I was eight months old, I was raised in Ventura County and now, and then I went to school in San Diego, moved to LA. I basically didn't major or study advertising or marketing at all. I kind of just fell into it, like probably a lot of other people. And then I just got really, really lucky that I was raised into a generation where the internet and digital and like YouTube and all of the things that we know now that are just so commonplace happened to become a thing that is more prevalent. And that I just got really lucky that I was just the young person in the room. I was able to learn all of the different things just because I was really interested in it. And especially because I was very interested, I was a musician. I still am a musician and writing music is always like a really big important part of me. So I was using 
the internet to promote myself mainly and my music. And then because of that, I got to know it in a more intimate way. I was very passionate about the Asian American community. Uh, a lot of that because of the fact that I'm adopted too. And that for me, I think identity takes on a different meaning. I think that identity for me, especially because I wasn't raised with an Asian background, it's been something that I think about quite a bit of like, who am I? What does this all mean to me? What does my ethnic background actually mean? Uh, and so it, it gives me a lot of different ways of thinking about life and the way that uh, life gets directed. I think because of all of those things, it's made me a lot more passionate about the Asian American community, finding things that I can relate to. And then ultimately it's led me to producing content and music and things that I think that other people can relate to as well. So that's basically where I'm at and now. That's where I started. Wow. I mean, I love the different layers of your life story and then eventually how that led into your passion in advertising, marketing, promotion, and also music. Let's start with the profession that you now have. What eventually led you to liking and having that deeper interest in advertising or marketing? Honestly, I think what it was is that I just, I really just fell into it. It wasn't like an aha moment of, now I love it. It's a, it was more of a, just a gradual thing of like, I didn't really know what advertising marketing was. I honestly still can't tell you probably the, the correct definition of the difference between both of those things. I just kind of just do it. And so a lot of these uh, things that maybe I should have learned in college, I'm really trying to catch up and I'm really trying to learn to be able to like speak the language now. And I think I'm a lot better at it, but for me, it was a, a gradual process and it wasn't until maybe like uh, three or four years ago that I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is what I, I, I love doing. I really enjoy what it is. And for me, the why is, is that, uh, especially cause I get to do particularly Asian American advertising that I really do love sharing stories that haven't been told at least from the brand perspective yet. And I, most importantly, I love being able to find opportunities for like the friends and people in my community that I can find ways to be able to pay them and uh, to elevate their work. And because of that, I feel like that it's fulfilled my mission that much more, uh, that I really love being able to support those around me that I love that are doing good work. And that gives me a lot of drive and a lot of passion. I love that. And I think it's good that you went back and you centralized your thoughts around your why. And the why is all about the community that you came to know and came to love that you are now directly serving and beautifully representing. And I think seeing a lot of the work that you've done, it centrals around that why and continues to rally that vocation that I think you have embraced over the last few years. Mm -hmm. So looking at, you know, your, your bio, um, you've produced with your partners, um, in international secret agents, like a lot of amazing content. Um, you've mentioned basically 400 amazing pieces. Um, if you were to, you know, summarize some of the key content or storytelling pieces that you've created over the last few years, what would be those amazing pieces that you would think that you'll be very proud of, that you fully represented the story of the AAPI community? And why is that very memorable to you? Jeez, just thinking about that is very overwhelming. And we could probably just have a separate podcast just talking about all of that and what international secret agents and like what it kind of all meant at that time. I guess a brief summary of some of the stuff that I'm the most proud about. Just really quickly, International Secret Agents is a platform that basically got, uh, was founded by Far East Movement and Wanford Productions in 2007, 2008. And it's right when they, as well as a lot of other people were first starting to use YouTube and the other digital technologies. And uh, prior to that time, like in 2005 even, like was at a time when people were just uploading videos just directly to, there wasn't like a website like YouTube. And it was really expensive to be able to upload content to like servers online. And you had to like do monthly subscriptions. And then from there, you had to share the link, get people to download your stuff. Streaming wasn't very good, like slash available at that time. And so because of that, you had a lot of people that were just uploading content to like random servers and then sharing content, like really, really just individually. So that actually also speaks to, I think like at that time, when we think about marketing and advertising, that it was really like super, super, super one-to-one. -one. We think about that as being the time, uh, like if we were maybe just talking about like maybe entertainment marketing, that like for a lot of people, it was like boots on the ground, handing out flyers or handing out mixtapes. 
um, hey, come to this event, come to this event. I remember like I did club promoting back in the day and it was like handing out flyers on the streets. We didn't have like social media to be able to like uh, uh, tag everybody that we knew at the time and be able to get out the word super quickly. So I think I really cut my teeth on on being able to do that. So that's why when digital became a lot easier to be able to spread the word, that I was really engaged with that, uh, most importantly for my own music. International Secret Agents came around at that time, uh, one of the very first Asian American digital platforms. Uh, but I, I obviously, I have a lot of respect for the people that came before that really sh like shaped the tone of Asian American content and allowed us to be able to do the things we were doing online. So shout out to everybody that was doing it before. They gave us the platform that we had when we were able to create the International Secret Agents platform. Uh, but we first started off, we were doing concerts and with a lot of uh, up and coming YouTube talent, Keena Granis, David Choi, Ryan Higa, a lot of people from back in the day. And then in 2010, 2011, we started an International Secret Agents YouTube channel. And so, uh, and as well as a website that became a hub for a lot of these Asian American things. And so we had a lot of different variety shows. We had a lot of different, uh, we, we had templates of things that are now commonly used, but we created like these little like internet shows. And it was pretty successful for a really long time. For about four years, we really, really like went hard on it. And Thinking about it now, it's kind of crazy, but I was pumping out like five shows a week uh, with a really small team. But then again, we get older, the algorithm changes, things, things become different, people's interests are different, your audiences grow up, uh, there's younger audiences that are becoming older. And so through all of that, again, just things things have to change. So, uh, anyway, so ISA got founded for that, we we're pumping out content. And then things that I'm pretty proud of, we did the very first uh, you know, like the Japanese Korean variety shows, mm. we produced the very first, not even just Asian American, but very first large scale, um, uh, uh production at the YouTube space in, in YouTube LA. And so, uh, we were the first people to be able to like use their space for a big high quality production for YouTube. And so we did a big variety show. It's currently still up on YouTube. Go to isatv.com. That was one of the very first big things that I'm proud of. We worked on a bunch of different, uh, Asian American reality shows, YouTube shows with a bunch of celebrities that are big now. I'm very proud of that. People that are big, big, uh, names at this point came through our system long ago. And so I'm very proud of that. And then finally, from the brand side, I've been able to produce a lot of really cool, like, like a, a digital content for different brands. Uh, one thing to point out, you'd mentioned Hennessy. Hennessy, during the pandemic time, we created a virtual concert for Hennessy, where we brought on talent like Nikki, Haley Kiyoko, uh, the Kinjas, Jay Park, and we produced a big virtual live show for them that got streamed. And it was one of the biggest things that I'd ever been a part of, but I was so proud of it. Uh, again, it allowed us to support really cool Asian American talent. I got to hire a lot of really cool people to help produce this creatively. And that I, uh, I just feel very proud of it. So that was specifically for like Lunar New Year and Mid Autumn Festival. Wow. That is an amazing case study, Dan. I would just have to say, like, you know, from the birth of innovation in the digital space, even before streaming, even before how social media became very much mainstream, having that kind of platform that you've just described and making Asian Americans the central part of it paved the way to a lot of creative talents and then showcasing those amazing talents to a larger, should we say, population or footprint, because it's the internet, everyone would have the opportunity to now experience and see that, but also finding a way to bring that in real life and also have brand connections that eventually monetize and was able to find value in what you initially did as a passion project, if I can say, to, you know, making the most of the amazing talent and the opportunities and the open doors that you have allowed for other people to do. It sounded very, I would say, bed of roses and very much ideal, but I am sure that there were challenges along the way. I'm sure that it wasn't an easy road when you've created that along with your partners. Can you talk us through some of those challenges that you've experienced when you were creating that? And um, how did you manage to address those challenges and how did you learn throughout the process? That's a great question. I think that, and I'm, I always, when I do these discussions, I always want to try to like maybe bring it back to what's relevant for your audience and, and thinking about it more from like the advertising or marketing standpoint of, of things that maybe would be a good call out. So I think the biggest thing that were challenges for me, but also might be challenges for other people is that 
I think it's really important that you build like really good teams around you, really good systems. I think for me, one of the biggest challenges was trying to execute a lot of these things and having to do a lot of it just on my own. And we're only one person. You can only do so much. And when I was younger, I was in burnt out mentality, uh, but in like the best possible way. Cause like when you're younger, you just have more energy. Um, and, and so I didn't mind having to burn myself out, but I do think that if I could have looking back on it, I would have built systems around me and had more people to support, uh, to be able to execute the things we were doing. But again, it was a brand new territory at that time. We didn't, we had no idea what it really meant to like build these things out. So, um, uh, it was, it was a learning process, but I think for anybody that's building anything on their own or building content or building uh, their companies or just trying to like work and, and, and build cool campaigns for brands. I think a lot of it just comes down to having really good teams and, and, and smart people around you. And th that's the other thing is that you're not the smartest person in the room. Surround yourself with other people that are going to be so much smarter than you because you learn from them and it enables you to grow and, and really uh, get yourself to there. And then finally, like I just really, although they were difficult at the time, the challenges are really good. You really have to internalize a lot of the the failures. I think it's internalizing the failures that really enable you to be better in life. Because if you don't know what you did wrong or you don't feel it deeply, you're not going to change that behavior. And so I think that people really do need to, as long as much as I don't want people to fail, you need to fail to like just know how bad it feels to fail so that you don't do it again. A lot of amazing insights to unpack there. First, the teams and the systems. Um, that's really very helpful. I think we're in an age right now where we need to be efficient because of the endless opportunities out there and everything is so democratized. We have a lot of tools that are available for free, thanks to the internet again and thanks to technology. But then again, to your point, creating those efficient ways and procedures and steps and helping each other via collaboration, I would have to say, is something I think um, especially for our community that we, uh, we all aspire to have and aspire to follow and eventually banner. And the other thing that you've mentioned that really struck me is like not being, you know, fearful of failure and, you know, not running away from challenges and seeing challenges in a positive light. I love how you've mentioned that we, it's okay to fail. I think my principle as well is it's okay to fail and it's good to fail fast and forward immediately mm -hmm. so that we can learn from these experiences and then take that with, with us moving forward. Just circling back now on the AAPI community, because I've seen your personal life story of your journey of going back to your roots, right? What did that experience bring to you as a person now that you are thriving in your field, both in advertising and in the music industry, did that add value to your growth as a person, knowing your origin story, knowing the history of your identity? And why did you become so interested to find that out, knowing that probably you're already complete as an you know, adopted kid here in the U.S. who experienced life in a good way? Yeah, I don't know. That's that's a really good question. It's uh, obviously, like personally, it's been so meaningful, and it's something that I don't take for granted. And I just I understand the how like I'm just a very grateful person, and that the fact that I was able to meet my biological family is something that that just is not it doesn't happen very often. And I think by being able to meet them, it definitely fulfilled um, a very, I don't like, I don't know if I was missing anything, but it definitely gave me something that now that I have it, I would notice the absence. I actually, maybe it's a, like, it's an interesting thing to think about that you don't know, you only know what you know. And until you have that knowledge or that thing that you, you had no idea was missing in your life, you didn't know how it was going to feel. It's kind of the way that my, my friends feel that are married or that have children and that they're that like, I have no idea what it's like to have kids. And I'm like, I don't think that my life is missing anything, but every one of my friends tells me that once you have that in your life, it's brand new. Your life becomes so colorful. And I don't know what that's like to have my life feel that way. And so it's, it's in a similar thing with now that I've met my biological family, I didn't know what I was missing until I, I didn't have it or until I had it. And uh, it's definitely been very fulfilling. And then as far as creatively though, and like the other things, once I met them, like I, I do think that like actually a weird like creative bug uh, disappeared. I, I wrote my first uh, solo album uh, after I met them, everything just kept on pouring out of me. And so it was a very creatively uh, opening 
experience for me. So like from the, the creative side, yeah, it was very helpful for that. Wow. Probably you needed to meet them to eventually start your music career because to your point, yeah. you started your first album because of that. That's very interesting. You know, we're, when you were growing up here, you had no idea about the other life you know, that was existing on that other side of the world. And you've met your family and even was surprised with having a brother and I, an identical twin brother. How did it actually feel the first time you met them and the first time you saw your identical twin brother? How was that kind of experience? I was very... I'm a pretty emotional, just kind of, I don't know. Like, I think that maybe this is like the adoption part of me, but I, I have a very specific existence where it takes a lot for me to get emotional about something. And I think that's just my defense mechanism is popping up. I don't get emotional about a lot of things. I think that's purely just personal internalized defense mechanisms. And so when I saw them, I didn't get emotional, but it's not because I didn't want to get emotional. It's just because like, I just been trained that way my entire life. And so it was more like, wow, like I was of course like interested. I was of course like, this is amazing. But I had so many different things going on in me that I it didn't show anything at all. And I was just like staring and it was amazing. <clears throat> um, it obviously like, I, I, I know how it feels. It feels so much different and that I'm so happy that they're in my life. But when I first met them, the short answer is like, no, I was just like looking at them. It's like, wow, this is like, this is crazy. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. And I think probably the takeaway after that, because as you've mentioned earlier, after you've met them, it inspired you to write your first album, which um, started your career in music. But I think the other thing that's really, you know, inspiring to me hearing that story was that very similar to a lot of AAPI folks in our community, because we we feel that we are marginalized. We feel that we're always fighting the odds of what's in front of us. And then in your, you know, personal life aspect, being an adopted AAPI kid, there's another additional layer. Well, in my personal experience, being part of the LGBTQ plus community is also another layer wherein mm -hmm. you kind of feel that you're fighting against a lot. You're trying to break all possible walls. That's like literally mm -hmm. in front of you. That mm -hmm. imposter syndrome will always be there. So mm -hmm. having experienced that and being able to brave that and successfully shatter all those challenges along the way, if you're going to talk to the younger folks who are listening to us, Dan, today, who are probably in the same boat that you were years ago, what would be you know, your suggestions or your advice or your words of inspiration to them that will help them in their journey? Good question. The direct answer is that, you know, Joseph, we're all just on these individual paths and we just get so lucky that we come across each other in, in the community in whatever way. And we're lucky that we get to have people in our lives. And I think it, we get caught up. And I think that our generation and the, the generations that are growing up now have so much stimulation and so many things around them. And this isn't really career advice, but it's just for us lucky enough to be able to have people in your lives, enjoy it, enjoy life. Um, things, things kind of work themselves out when they need to. The world works in mysterious ways. And I, as I look back on my own path that I had no idea that I was gonna be here where I'm currently at, I couldn't have predicted that I'd be where I'm at. I'm extremely happy with where I'm at right now, but, it just, there's going to be a lot of failures and things going back to the failure thing. I hope you fail. I hope that people, cause you really do need to know what it's like to not be in a good place. Cause that will put you in a good mindset to be able to overcome that if you're able to. And I acknowledge there's a lot of people that like it, some, some of the failures are really, really tremendous and damaging and, and that that could prevent somebody from wanting to pursue. But I hope that anybody that goes through a failure, you learn from it. And that it becomes a, a lesson that you learn later on, because that's what helps make us go in the direction that we're going. So um, anyway, embrace the failures um, and just enjoy the people that you're around and just be be a good person. Don't don't get caught up in the politics of work. That's my work advice. Don't get caught up in the politics of work. That stuff's not productive. It's not worth your time. I love that. Spot on. The whole toxicity is something that we shouldn't be fueling continuously and find ways to find our tribe, you know, 
to find the people who can actually help us and bring us up. I know that our community right now is very much into mentorship as well. We helping each other within our community. If folks will be trying to, you know, we'll try to look for mentors. What would be your advice to them in terms of how to best reach out to people whom they can feel can help them and can be their mentors? What would be the right approach? Where will they find them? And how will the relationship of a mentor and a mentee be shaped? Two things. First thing is good call out to the next gen program. There is an Asian American mentorship program for those in the creative advertising and marketing fields. We're going to announce the applications in June and we basically will partner you. We've had 400 people each year that will apply. We partner over 200 different pairings and we were able to, I think we do a good, pretty good job at like putting together the, the mentor mentee pairings. So join our mentorship program. That's the easiest way. Secondly, if you don't do that and you're looking for something more informal, or just looking for people if you're on LinkedIn. I actually learned this from the, the AIA conference that we went to. It was really good advice from somebody that is a mentor, but has people that want her to be their mentor uh, for them is that people don't want to, you need to offer something too. It can't just be like, hey, will you mentor me? Or like just reaching out to somebody randomly on LinkedIn. Don't do that. That's not going to get you there. They don't know you. You don't know them. That's not a good way to like get mentors or like to find a good like uh, relationship. Good mentors come after a period of time and getting to know somebody. So that way you both feel comfortable enough to be able to really, I think, share tangible things with one another. And there should be something that's tangible from both sides. And so you as the mentee, uh, I'm not saying that you need to like, there's nothing financial or nothing like social that you need to like provide for them. But uh, I think that it needs to be a thing where like, uh, you need to come super prepared. You need to be able to like know what it is that you want to get from the mentorship, but then also come with like, you obviously have a lot of advice too. I think that young people, you're growing up in a different generation right now than I grew up in. I want to know all about that. And so being able to be, it goes both ways. And so you should feel like that you want to be a mentor yourself as the mentee. So going in with attitude and then it takes time. And then finally, uh, find people that you really think you like uh, have trust and whatnot with, because that'll provide the best mentorship. And I am also advocating for reverse mentorship, which is what you've mentioned about us older folks being able to learn from the younger generation. I love that for sure. Um, which makes me interested to ask you, considering that you have a lot of accomplishments right now, but it really shows that you still embrace learning. You still embrace new things that you would want to experience in the future. What would be these exciting things that are up ahead that you're still very much interested to learn about, to get to know, to harness, and to explore in terms of your, whether music career, your advertising, or your content creation career that, you know, makes you feel fueled and makes you feel waking up every single morning, feeling more passionate and happy to face whatever it is that you're facing for that day? I love being at the age that I am because I love learning. I so wish that I had the money to be able to go back to school and to like get, get my master's in business. Like that's like, I, I want my MBA so much uh, because I'm finally like, it's not that I didn't enjoy learning when I was younger. I think that I've always like enjoyed learning, but I just didn't have focus. And now that I have focus and I know what it is that I'm like very interested in, I love, I love picking up business books. I pick up the Harvard Business Review books. They've got really good advice on like just uh, professionalism and whatnot. Like I'm, I'm so uh, in a place now where I want to do all that, but maybe the timing and whatnot isn't correct either. So I'm excited about learning just from the people that I'm, I'm with. I love learning from younger people. I love learning about like all of this new technology. I do think that AI is super interesting as well as devastating. And I just want to be able to like learn from that and see, and then just learning human behavior. I think that that's what I'm, I'm extremely interested in at my core. Uh, that's like what I'm the most interested in. I like learning how to communicate. I like learning when I communicate with you, Joseph, it's different the way that I communicate with somebody else. Uh, everybody's different. And I think that it's a, uh, a false or a, a fool's errand who think that there's only one way to communicate. Or if you're the type of person that's like, I need to be soft all the time, or I need to like use hard, uh, be more aggressive and, 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 and be that kind of attitude. That's not true. Maybe with some people you need to do, but you should have the nuance in your head to know when to speak up, when to hold and when to, when to ask. I think there's always different times to do that. It's just about being very self 
aware of the situation. So I think that self-awareness is a learning thing that I'm learning always and that people would be apt to learn how to do better. Love that. Like learning and relationship with people. Yeah. If you have both and you never surrender on both, then you're going to live a very happy and meaningful life. I would have to say you've mentioned earlier, by the way, going into our last question, because I asked my guests the same last question. You said that you're happy in your situation right now, in your own terms, ideal, you know, situation in your life right now that you're very much happy with. Uh, what fuels that? What for you, the meaning of a meaningful life and how do you live that every single day? It took me a long time to get to where I'm currently at. I, I'm, I'm, I feel very uh, fulfilled with what I'm doing. And I think a lot of people are looking for fulfillment at the core of like, when we get into these jobs, I think, especially for younger people that like, they're looking to feel fulfilled. They need something like an extra, it's not just the money. They need to feel like they believe in what they're doing. I, I believe in what I'm doing. And I think that for either leaders or for young people, sometimes it's just not possible. Like you can't like some, it, it's just the natural thing. You're going to be in a company that you just, it's, you're unable to be able to get that from. It's purely a transactional money thing. And I think that's totally fine too. But I think that you can fake that feeling uh, with two things. The first thing is just find a really good outside activity that you're really passionate about, that you can put time into. So that way you don't need to get it from your job. Your job doesn't need to be everything. It doesn't need to be your lifeblood, your social, your professional, your fulfillment. It's just never going to be possible. Um, it'll disappoint you if you ever expect that of it. So I think finding opportunities outside of your job that you're really passionate about, and then you can put that feeling into that. And then if, if you do need it from your job, because you're spending so much time at work as a worker, find a, a thing within your company that you can put your time into to feel like that you're leading it or that you're like, you can take ownership over it. So that way you feel the fulfillment. Maybe it's an ERG group. Maybe you like find an activity or like a, a new brief and you're like, oh, I want to take control over like leading that brief. Find that because that'll make you feel more fulfilled and more connected to your job. And then from the leadership perspective, it's really finding opportunities for your own uh, uh, people that you're leading to take ownership of her projects because that's going to make them feel more closely connected to the company. So I think the biggest thing is just feeling, finding opportunities, even the small ones to feel more connected and providing those opportunities for the people that are working for you, for them to feel more connected and take ownership over what they're doing. Very valuable insights and suggestions then. Thank you so much for sharing that with the audience. Now, I'd want to give you the floor to let people, you know, get to know you more or reach out to you if they have more questions. Thank you, Joseph. You can follow me on all the socials. I'm at Dan, aka Dan, D-A-N, aka D-A-N. You can see some of my work on my social media. Uh, if you want to go see some of my more direct work or the company, Transparent Arts, uh, we're a music label. Uh, if anybody ever wants help with like, especially Asian, Asian American artists, music, licensing, all that stuff, please reach out to us. Uh, and then from the broad side, I work on commercials. I work on consulting for digital projects. If you want an Asian American influencer or talent, hit me up. So we'd love to work with people on talent projects, anything of the above. Finally, my music's on Spotify. Look up Dan A.K. Dan. Listen to my music. I'm going to be putting out an album later this year. Well, good luck with all your endeavors, Dan. I'm really very happy with this conversation and so proud of everything that you're doing and the great example that's showing to the community. Thank you so very much, Dan. Joseph, thank you. It's an honor.